Hi, this is Scott Miller. Welcome to my top performance blog. I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Heidi Brotland from Norway. And Heidi, it's been almost one year to the date that I last spoke with you. Yeah. And, and at that time, you were, you had finished up a study on implementing FIT uh, in a hospital-based mental health clinic. Can we just go back and review just a bit, uh, because your work actually is having quite an impact. What you did originally uh, is, I, I feel like, one of the most important studies on FIT so far, which is to separate the ideas of doing feedback-informed care from its actual implementation in the clinical context, which are, as your data show, two very different things. Can you just tell us a little bit about the setting again and what you found in that original study? Sure. Uh, so this is a hospital-based uh, outpatient clinic, and it's a general clinic, so it serves all kinds of different diagnoses, but people would generally be quite uh, severely um, uh, impaired to be, uh, to be allowed in. Mm. And uh, we started implementing FIT, and then at the same time we started doing the study, more or less at the same time. Uh, so we compared treatment with FIT to treatment without FIT. And uh, in the beginning we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't know really how to do it. <laughs> and you know this because you trained us, right? Yeah. And we were very naive in the beginning. We had really, we had absolutely no idea. Hmm. And uh, so it took us four years to collect all the data that we needed to, to do a fair comparison. And so when we started analyzing the data, we, were, we did find that clients who had been treated with FET benefited more from treatment than those who had been treated without. But we were kind of surprised that the effect size was not larger than it actually was. So there was a significant effect, but it was not, wasn't super large. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we started looking into that and we said, well, uh, if, if we could do the study over again now, we would have a much larger effect because now we actually know how to use them, use them for and SRS. We, we, as I said, we had no idea in the beginning. Hmm. And so we, we wanted to look at whether the effect changed over time. So the clients who were, um, who were included in the very beginning of the study would benefit less from FIT than those who were recruited and included towards the end of those four years. And that's exactly what we found. Right. Which, so, makes a lot of sense in in terms of implementation science it it, mm -hmm. it makes sense as well but you mm -hmm. say you didn't know what you were doing to fit and then eventually in time you feel like you 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 managed to get better when i'm out and i'm providing training mm -hmm. i think many people see the two measures four items a piece and you have this fancy automated programs if you like it it presents beautiful graphs and what the hell's so hard to learn about this? Let's just mm -hmm. set it in place. Uh, how, how do you know that it was difficult? What tells you you know more about it na uh, now as opposed to then? Well, I think um, to me, one of the main challenges with working with FET is that uh, it tells you whether you're being helpful to the client or not. But it doesn't really tell you what to do if you're not being helpful. And that's the main thing that we were working on in, the, in that implementation process. So in the beginning, it also had to do with attitudes. We had to take it seriously. We had to, to work at taking the measures seriously, the information seriously, and say that, well, it's, it, I'm actually not being helpful. It's not just a measurement error or the client is more in touch with their feelings, so it doesn't really matter if their uh, functioning is not better than in the beginning, right? Hmm. So we needed to work first at accepting that if the ORS graph is not uh, showing improvement, then probably there is no improvement. That was a big kind of something that we had to accept. No, we, we didn't really believe that uh, our clients would improve early in therapy. So you know that the ETR, the yeah. way it's set up with yeah. early, you know, it's kind of, yeah. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't believe in that. We thought that our clients, no, seriously, I mean, you kept telling us, but we didn't believe it. We, we said, well, we work with personality disorders and psychotic patients, mm. so they're not going to improve that early. It's going to take more time, and we we um, we spend a lot of time doing an assessment in, in the beginning before we start therapy. So we we can't really expect that. And also, some people need to get worse before they get better. So we were talking to you on Skype, and you kept repeating that you know early improvement is a strong predictor of therapy outcomes. 
and we didn't we were like yeah yeah sure Scott it's probably true for American college students but not our group of people right right, right. Did I tell you this then I went in and, and uh, got out all the finished therapies that we had at the time I think it was about 160 and then I looked at the I looked at what session could we see improvement in at what session did we have a green score you know above the ATR and uh, and I found that I think about 80% had uh, improvement within the first five sessions, about 50% from session one to session two of those that ever, you know, scored higher, significantly higher than the first session. And then um, the group that had uh, early improvement, improvement within the first five sessions, I think they were about eight and a half times more likely to end up benefiting at the end of treatment. So that was very strong and that was a really important step in our implementation process. So this is not something I publish, but I keep telling it to people when I train them because it's so interesting. It's kind of uh, close to home. Mm -hmm. was, was that finding something that pushed people finally into trusting the measures and trusting absolutely. the predictive algorithms? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Wow. And it's something when I show it to people, when I give trainings, it's very, it has a large impact to them. Because it's very easy to dismiss uh, studies that are, are, have been done, you know, in America or somewhere else with a difference. Easy to say that it's not going to be like that with our clients. Right. But these were our clients, so we couldn't dismiss it. Wow. Yeah. And so this second study, yeah. can, you, can you tell us something about that? Mm -hmm. We wanted to try and understand how it works, which is a very important question, I think. Mm. Uh, because if we know how, how it works, we know what to focus on in therapy and we can work back, you know, it, it, it goes back to the question of what to do when, when we're, we're not being helpful. And there are certainly, I think, in the present discourse about feedback or routine outcome measurement, there are certainly ideas and assumptions that are being made about yeah. how it works. But mm -hmm. this is really one of the first and serious studies that has mm -hmm. looked at it empirically. Yeah, I think in terms of, of theories, there hasn't been done that much work. And we have a couple of feedback theories about how they work, but they're not, I don't think it, they explain everything. I think the field has been, with, you know, this it was a new in, uh, intervention, Ram was a new intervention, and people were really enthusiastic about it, and, and all these different studies were popping out everywhere and uh, showing an effect. And then people didn't really stop to, to think, what is this? Why, how does it work? What is it? We didn't theorize about it and we didn't do any research on it. And I think it's time now, especially because they, they don't seem to, to always do the trick. That's it doesn't true. always seem to work. That's exactly so we need true. to know what the effective elements are so that we can make them work. <laughs> That's right. And if, if we continue to do the same randomized clinical trial of feedback and no feedback, we're not going to get any further. Exactly. And secondly, I've noticed there's a tendency to interpret the findings in a very, very particular way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that produce, we fit it into our current way of thinking. Well, it works with these types and di mm -hmm. of diagnoses in people, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work with these other types of diagnoses in people. Yeah. And we yeah. still really don't have any idea about what's going on in the yes. use of this intervention that makes it work. Yeah. Yeah, and what do I do as a therapist? When it circles back to the question for me, so I'm I'm with a client and I'm not being helpful. What do I do? Right. That's a big, big question, and that's I I re I feel like I need the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. It's helpful to me to know if it's not effective with the personality disorder because I have to have those people as well, right? Right. It's not I can select the clients that I work with. No. I just really I want I want I'm I'm being told that I'm not being helpful by the ORS. And I need to know what to do about it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to approach in this study, right? Yes. That's the, or that's what I wanted to try and find out. And since the PCOMS or the FIT uh, emphasizes the alliance so much, so strongly through the SRS, that was a very natural way, place to start. So we tested the hypothesis that some of the reason why clients who've been treated with FIT benefited more from treatment was that FIT had a good impact on the alliance, that FIT helped therapists uh, improve the alliance over time. That was right. the hypothesis. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, and the way that we tested it is, well, first we, we, we looked at whether clients who'd been receiving treatment with FIT uh, in, uh, had a more alliance improvement over time. 
Yes. So we were looking at, we were interested in looking at the alliance over time, not just at one point in time, but the way whether it improved, increased over time or not. Isn't it amazing that this is kind of a new and novel idea? Uh, mm -hmm. Because throughout the history of the field, we've been measuring the alliance often at single points of contact mm -hmm. and then looking for its impact on outcome. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you were looking at it uh, in this particular study uh, over time. Exactly. And I think as most therapists will recognize that the alliances or the relation, the therapeutic relationship is not something that's static. It's something that's continuously evolving and, and, uh, and that the, the change, the development of it, it really can have quite a large impact on, on the client. Yes. And, uh, so the next step then was to look at whether alliance increase over time was associated with better outcomes so that the clients who had in, uh, experienced more alliance increase then had better outcomes. Right. And that's exactly what we did find. So we found that compared to clients who had been treated without FET, those who had been treated with FET experienced more alliance growth over time, over the first two months of treatment. Wow. So the alliance improved. Right. And we found that the more clients' alliances improved, the better their outcomes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And the implication of this for that, mm -hmm. what do we do with my client's question when treatment mm -hmm. isn't working? Mm -hmm. In your mind, if you take this finding and try to extrapolate and think mm -hmm. clinically, what, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. I th yeah. We should work at improving the alliance. Hmm. That's I th that's the easiest way of saying it. It's important. It's not important to have a perfect alliance from session one. In our fit condition, the alliance was actually worse after the first session with fit than without. That didn't have anything to say for the outcomes. We checked to see if it meant worse first session alliance meant worse outcomes. It didn't. There hmm. was no connection. But the increase over time had a big impact on outcomes. Right, mm -hmm. right. Which interestingly enough goes all the way back to some preliminary research that Jeb Brown did mm -hmm. back in, I think it was 2009. And then yeah. uh, Jesse Owen replicated this in a sample of kids showing that this improving alliance effect. And then now this, this particular study that you mm -hmm. led has added that fit in fact, works in part by a quarter mm -hmm. of the effect of it is by improving the improving the alliance between client and therapist. Yeah, and not just that, it's not just a finding that's been shown in the context of ROM, but outside of that as well. I mean, there is uh, uh, there is accumulating evidence that improvement in the alliance from one session to the next precedes improvement in symptoms. Right. Right. Exactly. That first the alliance improves and then distress. The uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Then the symptoms. The stress uh, follows. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So right. It, it does look like we're looking at or we're approaching an understanding of the alliance as, as a working mechanism in therapy, which of course is not a new idea. My sense when working with, you know, I'm back in the clinic now, so I see 20 clients a week and it's kind of changed a little bit how I work with it and how I understand and think about it. And I think that, um, to me, the SRS, I, I think when we did the paper, I, I thought that it was about the SRS. But now it feels to me as if though, it's not really about the SRS, but it's, it's not really about the conversation that I have with the client about the SRS during the last five minutes of every session. That's just icing on the cake. That's just a tiny little, it's a tiny segment of a, of a therapy. But it's uh, something that's kind of attuning me to, to the topics. It's, it's a constant reminder of, of the Alliance. Both it's to me. in your mind all the time. It's in my mind, yeah. And I think I'm more attuned to it yeah. and pay more attention to it throughout the whole session. And I think those are the things that we talk about throughout the whole session. That's probably more important than what we do towards the end. Yes. It's, it's not about did you get all the goals negotiated collaboratively by the end of the visit, but am I working collaboratively with the client in this moment and the next? Yeah. And why am I choosing to do that now and not not mm -hmm. not now, so to speak, mm -hmm. making yeah. me aware of all of that. Exactly. So when I do training, people will often ask me, do you have time during those last five, five minutes? What do you do when you get a low SRS score? What do you do about it? And how can you fit that large conversation, which it has to be within those five minutes? And, and the answer is that you can't. 
what I encourage people to do when I train them is to just stop the fire. So in the last five minutes of the session, the client tells you that I'm not happy with this or that. This is not the time when you start um, exploring if it has to do with their relationship to their mother. That's not it. You don't have the time for it. You have a new client coming in five minutes. So what you do is you say, thank you so much for telling me. And I'm so sorry. And I, I appreciate the honesty and um, really, really, really happy you told me. And so Heidi, am, am, I, am I reading your affect correctly here? Uh, because um, I get kind of a, and I, I don't want to uh, ask you to, to reveal your deepest feelings, but I get, I, I do get a sense of kind of um, somehow excitement as you approach these questions. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's funny you should notice that. I, you know, I'm back in the clinic now. I've been doing my PhD for four years and I've been out of the clinic and uh, it's uh, a lot more exciting to be back than I thought it would be. I really love working with the clients and I have a lot of fun doing it. Hmm. And I, I definitely think that fits uh, has something to do with it. It's, it gives me some kind of a security that if I make a mistake, I will have the opportunity to, to fix it again, or to, you know, to make it right. Hmm. So I think it's making me a little bit more playful, maybe with the client, that I can take more chances or try out things that I'm not sure is going to work because I feel confident that if it's a really bad idea, either the, the client will tell me or I will not notice that they're getting worse and mm. then I can change. Great. So I think, yeah. Mm. So I think you've my affect right. I am enthusiastic about clinical work and mm. it's, it's about the work. It's not about the measures. It's not about the measures. It's about meeting people and helping them change. It's an incredibly rewarding work that we do. Yeah. And uh, the measures is just something that we do in the beginning and the end of every session that's kind of keeping us on track, but it's not, it's not really about the measures. It, it isn't, right? and, it, well, and the measures aren't the work. That, that's exactly well, right. And when, 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 when I say that, people get very confused. Are we not supposed to use the measures? No, I say, use the measures. Use the yeah. measures. Because <laughs> it inspires in them the same thing I'm seeing in you, which is a tolerance of, of um, even yourself. You can try new things, you can do some things, and, and an awareness that mistakes will be made. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the uncertainties that are just a routine part of the work. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, Heidi, thanks so much for talking with me. My pleasure. And I look forward to your next research project. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's about therapist development, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Exciting stuff. Mm -hmm.